This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. A Manitoba woman is calling for better security on Winnipeg Transit. She's speaking out after feeling threatened on a city bus. CBC's Alana Cole explains. It was after work on Tuesday when Donna Gus Pedarchuk got on the number 18 at a bus stop on Graham Avenue. She says as she shuffled to the back of the bus, she heard someone talking loudly. Soon, she says, he turned his attention to her. As I got closer, he looked at me and he's like, there's a snake around your neck. And he's like, you're going to die. Do you want to die? And I was like, oh, holy. I was like, no, I don't. Gus Pedarchuk says she noticed the man had his pants down and was scratching his groin area. She says he then reached down near his right leg. He goes, nobody wants to die, right? I was like, this is it. I was like, this is it. I thought he was going for a knife or something. <laughs> this is just the latest instant highlighting safety concerns on Winnipeg Transit. The Transit Union says there were about 130 physical and or verbal assaults on transit staff in 2022. And that doesn't include incidents involving passengers. Today, the city told CBC Winnipeg Transit is committed to providing a safe transit service and work environment. That a transit advisory committee is exploring options for a long-term safety plan. And they advise passengers to call police when something happens. Gus Pedarchuk says the man continued to antagonize her until he got off the bus. She says another passenger at the front told him to leave her alone. She wonders why the driver didn't step in. She wants to see security on buses and wants people to call 911 if they witness something like this. Even though nothing physically happened, it really affected my mental health. Gus Pedarchek says she spoke with police last night. Winnipeg police say they don't recommend people intervene if it puts them in danger and that passengers are encouraged to call police in unsafe situations. Alana Cole, CBC News, Winnipeg. A spokesperson for the mayor says Scott Gillingham has spoken with the justice minister about potentially using peace officers for security on the transit system. The mayor's office says the city will work towards further steps in the upcoming budget. The family of a Flin Flon woman found dead earlier this week is questioning what happened. RCMP say Kara Fossenov's death appears not to be criminal, but the family does not agree. CBC's Brittany Greenslade reports. At just 27 years old, Kara Fosino's family says the mother of three had so much life left to live. Kara was loved. Kara is sacred, and her children are now going to grow up without her. Will the sounds of kids' toys still linger in the air? Her sister Robin says they're devastated she's gone. She had things she wanted to do in life, and so much that she's missing out on now that she's taken from us. It's unbelievable. Instead of celebrating her recent job and the new year together, her aunt Renee Gambling Kastrikoff says they're left planning her funeral. It's really hard and in the days to come it's, you know, it's, it's going to be sinking in even more real and harder um, as we prepare things for Kara. Um, got her moccasins yesterday, making her a ribbon skirt. Fosinov disappeared on New Year's Eve. Her family says she didn't have her cell phone or any extra clothes, and she wasn't active on social media. Eight days later, she was found dead, and the family's been left with no answers as to what happened. Right now. <laughs> it's just really, really difficult for the family, and with everything up in the air and no answers... The family tells CBC News her body was found by RCMP officers Sunday night in the garage at the home she shared with her grandparents. RCMP say although foul play isn't believed to be a factor, nothing is being ruled out until an autopsy is complete. But the family believes her death is suspicious. 
Kastrikov says a family member had been in the garage the day before and there were no signs of her. We don't believe that she put herself there. While they wait to lay her to rest, the family says they won't rest until they have answers. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. A Manitoba church has been fined thousands of dollars after admitting in court to breaking COVID-19 rules. The Church of God Restoration, south of Steinbach, accepted a plea bargain for repeat offences. As CBC's Josh Crabb reports, the penalty could have been much higher. A representative from the Church of God Restoration appeared in court Thursday and admitted to holding indoor gatherings despite public health restrictions. Court heard the church, located south of Steinbach, was repeatedly ticketed for holding in-person worship services when gatherings were either limited or prohibited entirely under the Public Health Act. The aggravating factor in this case is the repeated nature of the behavior, Crown Attorney Sean Sass told court. The church admitted in a plea bargain to two counts covering six offenses between November 2020 and May 2021. Pastor Tobias Tissen was a vocal opponent of the measures and was ticketed himself multiple times for violating the act. Court heard enforcement officers issued tickets after they attended the church, saw cars in the parking lot and people exiting and entering. The services at times were also streamed on Facebook. Provincial Court Judge Michael Clark accepted the deal struck by the Crown and Defence for a $30,000 fine. Those are fines that meet the sentencing principle of deterrence, Clark told court, that specifically this church will think twice if public health orders are put in place, considering that these fines are significant to them. Defence lawyer Alex Steigerwald told the judge the church relies on donations from its 70 members. He argued finances are tight and the fine will have an impact. The church was put in a difficult position where they were essentially being forced to pick between government over the orders and their faith, Steigerwald told court. Ultimately, it was a matter of faith which led them to continue to have the religious services, their worship services. Court heard the maximum sentence under the Public Health Act per charge is $1 million, but Sass told the judge that's well beyond what was contemplated in this case. We feel that this joint recommendation addresses the issue of deterrence, Sass told court, showing people that it's unacceptable to simply break the laws if you don't agree with them for whatever reason. The representative from the church declined an opportunity to address the court. The judge agreed to give them seven years to pay the fine. Josh Crabb, CBC News, Winnipeg. Pierre Polyavre tore apart the Liberal government today at a speech in Winnipeg. But outside that room of 500 supporters, the federal Conservative leader took heat for who arranged the event. CBC's Ian Fraze explains. Before Pierre Polyavre took to the stage, the president of the Frontier Centre for Public Policy acknowledged some criticism about their group. There have been 10,000 posts on the Frontier website if you look and chances are that one or two might rub you the wrong way. But opposition MPs say it's worse than that. They slam Polyev for associating with the Winnipeg think tank. If you want to become the next Prime Minister of Canada, certainly you shouldn't uh, fraternize with uh, you know, groups that perpetuate hate, perpetuate bigotry and racism. The Frontier Centre once ran radio ads that called residential school harms a myth. One recent article said white men are the only victims of systemic discrimination. A Frontier Centre leader says they aren't extremists. Oh, that's silly. We invite people from all political backgrounds, and it's very important to have open discussion uh, that's linked to fact, and we have a variety of perspectives. Polyev did not address any of these criticisms in his speech. Like in Ottawa, he launched a blistering attack on the Liberal government. He blamed the feds for inflation and soaring housing prices. Ladies and gentlemen, if after seven years he was not going to fix these problems, he will never fix them. And that is why we need to replace him with a new government that will work for the people. He says he'd used a port of Churchill to ship oil, earning cheers. Not just for the benefit of our resource sector, but for the benefit of all Manitobans as well. Inside the room, Polyev earned praise from Tory voters. I believe that Pierre Polyev has the potential to make sure that young people just like me are able to eventually have the money to afford a home one day. And the undecideds. 
This speech was quite convincing, right? He's definitely giving his opposition a run for their money. Polyev was not made available for an interview. A spokesperson says the conservative leader doesn't agree with everything the Frontier Centre has published, and speaking to them isn't an endorsement. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. The Winnipeg Renovation Show kicked off today, and it runs until Sunday. The headline speaker is Brian Baumler. He's known for his shows such as Disaster DIY and House of Brian. Now his top-rated HGTV show, Island of Brian, is in its fourth season. Baumler's speaking to a crowd right now at the Renovation Show, and that's where CBC's Jim Agapito is tonight. Jim, what's going on at the show? Yeah, Emily, it's a, it's a packed house. Like, we have so many things around us. We have renovation companies. We have duvet companies. We have home decorating companies and so much more. And yes, I did have a chance to speak to Brian. You know, he's a household name in home renovations, you know, on television. And he's very passionate about getting people to try home renovations and different things. I had a chance to speak to Brian Baramler earlier today. Brian, question for you. Okay. What's the most common thing that people ask you at shows like this? Yeah, the number one question I get by far is, when are you coming to my house? That is the number one. You know, apart from that, people want to know secrets from, you know, they want to peek behind the curtain in the, in the TV show production, and they want to know things about their own homes, you know, where to spend their money to get the most bang for their buck, you know, how to fix certain things, where to start. Uh, so I get a lot, but yeah, when are you coming over is number one. Has anyone invited you over yet? Uh, yes, yes. I wasn't even off the airplane. I got some invites, so it's great. <laughs> That's great. Now, mistakes. What are the most common mistakes people do when they're doing home renovations? Again, you know what? It's not necessarily something physical. It's overestimating their ability, underestimating how long it will take, underestimating what it's going to cost, and how much they'll actually enjoy doing the job themselves. Uh, when it comes to choosing someone to do the work, it's 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 generally being in a rush and, and picking the lowest quote. Okay, so then expenses and, you know, what the costs are, you know, like um, how do we make sure people don't make a whole bunch of, you know, expensive mistakes? Well, I think you have to do the research. If you're going to do it yourself, decide that you're going to spend the time to learn how to do it. Realize you're going to spend a little extra money, take a little extra time. If you're hiring someone to do it, you really do, in most cases, get what you pay for. You have to do your research uh, in behind, not be in a rush, and, and be willing to spend the money on the important things in your home uh, to reduce your operating costs and your long-term maintenance costs versus the cosmetics that everybody wants to spend the money on. So what are some of those things that they should be spending money on? I mean, for me, it's upgrading insulation in the attic. If you have the opportunity to spray foam the house, that's great. Putting on a lifetime roof, you know, a metal roof, something like that. Uh, you know, upgrading your windows and, and really working on that building envelope, especially here in Winnipeg, where it can get, it can get a little bit chilly. You know, it's, it's, I hear it warmed up a little bit this weekend, which is great. But it's spending money on things that will re reduce the cost of heating and cooling your home uh, and maintaining your home long term, because that's the savings that ultimately you put back in your pocket. Now, in terms of, you know, you've been in the renovation game for a long time. A while. So what's the most, you know, important, you know, um, things that someone's told you about home renovation? Oh, geez, I'd have to go back to, uh, you know, my dad's advice. He said, show up when you say you'll be there, do what you say you'll do, cash the check, pay your taxes, go to sleep and do it all again tomorrow. That's great. That's great. Okay. How do I get a chance to come to your island? Uh, you can go on the website, surrealmar.com. Actually, we have a booth here at the show with the Baumler approved booth as well. Uh, and just, just book a, book a spot, fly down. We'll, uh, we'll go fishing. Okay, well, I'm taking you up on that, Brian. All right, I'll see you there. <laughs> Thanks so much. And that was Brian Baumler. You know, he's an HTV star, and he'll be here at, at the Winnipeg Home Renovation Show, you know, tomorrow speaking on stage. So if you want more information about that, please check out their website at the winnipegrenovationshow.com. And later on, we'll bring you some more interesting stuff like <laughs> renovated RVs. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Well, time now for your CBC Manitoba weather forecast with Fiona Odlum. Sounds like some pretty mild temperatures coming up. Oh, 
the streak continues. The, this January is going to go in the books, I'm sure, for being so darn mild. And it's actually going to get warmer. But we had something happen today. We saw the sun and it was captured by our viewers. Let's take a look at this viewer photo that was sent into us by Nicole Freed. Look at this cotton candy bluebird sky. We haven't seen you in a while. Thank you, Nicole. And you know, we also got this picture sent into us from Anita. I love our Winnipeg downtown with all the little lights and everything. It looks so fantastic. Thanks, Anita, for sending that one in. Okay, well right now we're sitting at minus 13 degrees. We're actually gonna warm up as we move through the evening tonight. We have a very uh, interesting wind chill. We haven't had one in a while, and lots of folks in the newsroom were like, Fiona, it's so cold. I'm like, it's January. <laughs> but here's what's going to be coming for the weekend. A big warm up on the way towards us. Right now in Winnipeg, we're dealing with some cloud cover through the region, a little bit of snow towards the northern portion. But right now, it's really smooth in the city. Outside the city, it's a different story because of the wind. That's been an ongoing factor, wind gusts into the 60s today. So we're looking for on Saturday, you can see all that pink there, those little bits of pink, that's freezing rain, and that is gonna be an issue for us. And this low starts moving in from Saskatchewan. This is gonna ice everything up from Saturday into Sunday. Be careful if you're traveling along the highway uh, over the weekend. It moves very quickly, and we should warm up again by uh, Monday. Not a lot of snow, you see it tracing through here but it is going to be mixed with that rain and slush, and that is going to be our biggest issue. Minus 8 at midnight, a partly cloudy sky. We're going to watch for that fog developing as well. The wind, if you're on the open exposed areas, that'll be enough to make it difficult on the highway. Around 8 a.m., we're looking for minus 9. We're going to warm up a little bit more. Minus 5 by lunch, looking for a daytime high tomorrow of minus 3 degrees. By Sunday, minus 1. Seasonal is is seasonal is usually minus 13 for a daytime high. So you can see how far we're off the mark. Not ruling out a little bit of snow for us on that Sunday into Monday. And thankfully, we're going to see a bit of sunshine coming back to us on Tuesday. Nice. Sounds like great weather for getting outside, you know, skiing, sledding, whatever you want to do out there. All the big S's. Skiing, <laughs> sledding, sk snowmobiling. Skating. Skating. <laughs> <laughs> but Emily, I want to add one more thing on there. Snow mazing. I went to southern Manitoba and I found a pretty remarkable snow maze. Let's check it out. St. Adolph, Manitoba is home to the world's largest snow maze. And this year, it's getting bigger. Angie Moss, this place is just exploding with activity right now. Tell me what's going on here at the Snow Maze at Amazing Corn. Oh yes, it is very busy. Actually, you may not be able to see them at the moment, but there are uh, carvers in pretty much every building. They're creating the snow bar over there. Um, the snow maker is going, the piston bully is pushing snow around to make snow mountains. So there's just so much to create, but unfortunately it takes so long to create it. So now what challenges have you encountered this year with the weather and making the snow maze? Oh yeah, as always, you know, whenever you deal with mother nature, you're at the, the beck and call of the weather. Um, it started out too warm and then it got too cold. And um, uh, of course, with all the snow, everybody thinks that's helpful, but um, we do make all of our own snow with the snow makers over there um, because it uh, packs harder and it actually turns to cement. So it's really stable. Is there an ideal temperature for, for making a snow maze? Well, there's the ideal temperature for the workers who really love this uh, temperature. It's very nice to be outside, as opposed to last year when it was like minus 30 and we were frozen. Um, but the only problem is anything warmer, like for example, this weekend, we probably won't work because it's too warm. And then all the tractors sink. So, and then it also doesn't make nice snow. It makes it very yellowy and wet, obviously. So from beginning to end, how long does it take? A long time, yes. Very different than the corn maze. Um, I would say for sure for the maze part, about a month. Um, but then of course we add 
all the buildings and the sculptures and um, these people are so creative in terms of what they create and then of course we keep adding more and more and then it takes longer and longer and winter is only so long so hopefully January 28th is when we're hoping to open and you keep adding more and more and more and you are the Guinness Book World Record holder how big is it going to be this year it's always a little bigger, just in case someone's out there to challenge us. So we still hold the record. I think that was back in 2019. This is our fifth snow May season. And um, so we've only gone for the title that one year and I haven't heard of anybody breaking it. So we're still the record holders. Um, but needless to say, we always have it in our back pocket that hopefully we're still always the largest. Okay, before I let you go, tell me about this thing hiding behind me. What is that? <laughs> yeah. If you are looking for a new uh, place to live, this last year it was a church, which was so beautiful. And this year it's a little hobbit house. And it's so cute and hence the little rounded door and you go in, it has all kinds of things in there. I don't want to give it away because you have to come and see it in person. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Angie, I can't wait to get lost in the maze. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Still ahead, three people are still missing after a blast destroyed much of a Quebec propane business. We'll have the latest after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Quebec authorities remained at the scene today of an explosion and fire. The blast destroyed much of a propane distribution business yesterday north of Montreal. Three people are still missing. CBC's Valeria Corey Minocchio reports. We're about 100 meters away from where the explosion and fire happened Thursday morning. Provincial police are still on the scene here, continuing their investigation. They say that the event seems to have been accidental in nature and not criminal. Police also told us that they've been in contact with the family members of the three people who are still missing. Right now, they are not ready to reveal uh, any information about their identities. Uh, we are in contact with the families of the victims. We offered assistance and uh, we are very uh, concerned about all the questions they could have and uh, we, we try to inform them step by step what we are doing uh, every day. Uh -huh. This explosion has rocked this small community. Earlier today, the mayor of saint roch de la Chigan was visibly emotional as he thanked Quebecers uh, for their support and words of encouragement. We also heard from the family who owns the uh, fuel distributor. They say that two of the three uh, missing people uh, were employees and the other was a subcontractor. This is our family's company. I would like to give my sincere sympathies to the families of the victims who are still missing. This is an extremely difficult day for us. It's a first in 67 years. Quebec Provincial Police say the investigation uh, is expected to take a few days. They're working with firefighters as well. Uh, they say that it's a complicated scene and elements like the snow uh, that's been falling here do make things more challenging. Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, saint roch de la Chigan. The woman accusing prominent Quebec Cardinal Marouillette of inappropriate conduct has revealed her identity. She says she wants to come forward to help bring change to the church. CBC's Alison Northcott has the story. Pamela Grolo says she wants to restore her dignity. Je ne suis plus F, je suis Pamela Grolo. She no longer wants to be known only as F, as one of more than 100 complainants in a class action lawsuit against the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Quebec alleging sexual misconduct by dozens of clergy. Grolo wants people to know she is behind allegations of unwanted sexual touching by a high-profile cardinal, Marc Ouellet. She says she turned to the legal system after the church's internal process let her down. They didn't recognize me as a victim, she says. Cardinal Ouellette is a prominent figure in the Roman Catholic Church. Once the Archbishop of Quebec, he now works closely with the Pope. In a statement, a lawyer for the Cardinal said he maintains that he never committed the acts of which he is accused. Ouellette is suing Grolo for defamation, seeking $100,000 in damages for injury to his reputation, honour and dignity. Grolo's lawyer says it's a rare move. It's not a way to um, address a complaint of sexual abuse, and um, that's why she was uh, very disappointed. And it could dissuade others from coming forward, says journalist Robert Mickens. It's a warning, and I don't think that anybody who's been abused uh, would want to take uh, the extra uh, kind of risk of, of being first not believed and then to be sued. Grolo says since signing on to the class action, she's received anonymous threats she worries could impact her job within the Catholic Church. The Archdiocese of Quebec said it respects the protocol in place for the treatment of allegations of sexual abuse. We have confidence in this independent and confidential process. The Vatican did not respond to a request for comment. Grolo says she remains part of the church and hopes she can help change it. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. By most measures, Canadians pay the highest cell phone rates in the world. The latest marketplace investigation looks into why and the barriers limiting more competition. CBC's David Common reports. Canada has among the highest wireless rates in the world, more than Australia, France and Ireland, where we ask users to carry out identical tasks. I'm going to get you to open the YouTube app on your phone. Comparing costs to what global consulting firm ReWheel calculates as the data rate for each nation. So the YouTube download for the average cell phone user in Australia? 17 cents to do that, but in Canada, a dollar three. 
Whoa, that's just such a big difference. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, it's huge. It's yeah, it's huge. humongous. Canada's wireless companies say the country is vast, infrastructure therefore expensive. But Australia is also big, sparsely populated in areas, and yet way cheaper. I don't even bat an eye if I'm on or off Wi-Fi, like it doesn't matter. Canada's rules favour providers with their own infrastructure, making it very expensive for new competitors to start up. Entrepreneur Anthony Lacavera tried creating Win Mobile and building his own towers because the big three, he says, made it very hard to lease space on theirs. We're allowing these oligopolies to continue to function and to consolidate even further. But we can't fault them for that. We have to have the government step in and fix this once and for all. The wireless industry points out prices have gone down recently and argues there is competition between Bell, Rogers and TELUS. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Well, tonight, Marketplace puts the big three phone companies, Bell, Rogers and TELUS, to the test by setting up their own call centre of Canadians to find out who might get the best deal. Tune in to the people versus the phone giants tonight at 8 p.m. on CBC. Well, people in Toronto heard the stunning news last week of a home being sold by someone who was not the owner. CBC News has now learned of a similar case where the scheme was uncovered before any papers were signed. CBC's Farah Morali reports. I can't even form words to describe that moment at that time because it's just so unbelievably out there. It's Melissa Walsh's reaction to stumbling across this. Photos of the home owned by her great uncle on the MLS site for sale though no one in the family had listed it. The family asked us not to show the home's address to protect the elderly owner. The 95-year-old moved into a long-term care home and the family hired a realtor to rent out the home to help cover expenses. The agent found tenants, a lease was signed, but it appears no one actually moved in. Instead, within a month, the home was staged and was listed for $1.29 million. It even received multiple offers. The family later learned the original tenants used bogus information to rent the home. Then, someone impersonated the owner to hire realtors to list the home. CBC News has learned this case is related to one Toronto police announced last week, where a home was actually sold without the owner's knowledge. When we found out that this happened to another family, this wasn't just a one-time situation. Uh, we thought it was horrible. The case didn't surprise this lawyer who fought a landmark mortgage fraud case in 2006. The reality is is that um, when you consider how much uh, a home is now worth in the GTA, this is a high value crime. Experts say fraudsters seem to target homes with no mortgages, removing a layer of bank oversight, as well as absentee homeowners or rentals, giving them access to the home and mail. Some are now calling for industry changes, where the common practice to list a home is to see one piece of government ID. We need to uh, train realtors and, and change the best practices that we uh, employ. We need to be teaching realtors these websites that you can use to verify identities. The agents involved were from different Royal LePage brokerages. The company maintains its agents followed all due protocol and had no reason to be suspicious. Not enough for Walsh's family, still in disbelief how their family home nearly slipped through their fingers. Farah Morelli, CBC News, Toronto. Well, still ahead, Fiona Odlum is back with a look at the Manitoba forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Fiona Odlum is back with the Manitoba forecast. So how's it look for the weekend? Can we get out there and walk around? It's going to be a great weekend to get out and about. You're going to wear a thin jacket. What? Yeah. <laughs> you might want to leave your mittens at home even. Oh, wow. It's going to be that kind of weekend. But in the evening, I want you to keep an eye to the sky because we haven't seen some aurora this week. Uh -oh. And look at this beautiful <gasps> picture sent in from Jerry and Russell. Now, that is top-notch Aurora. And we got this picture from Ruby in Ashern. P.S. I love Ashern. This has a sweet spot in my heart. I spent a lot of summers here. And Ruby got some uh, Aurora as well over during the week. Thank you so much for letting us share those photos. All right, we're sitting at minus 11 in the Forks and Selkirk, minus 9 in Steinbeck. As we zoom out, we're going to be looking for minus 7 in Dauphin, minus 11 in Swan River, nice and warm in minus 9 in Barrens River. Don't forget, this whole area right now is struggling with that really strong wind gusting into the 50s right now. Churchill sitting at minus 19 degrees. We're going to see a bit of a clearing trend for you. Thanks to that low, that's finally going to be pushing out. That's the one that brought all that snow over the last little bit. But it's this system here. It's going to come one, and then there's going to be the second one that is going to meet up, and they're going to make a mega low, and we're going to see snow and rain and freezing rain mixed in there. And that is going to be our problem Saturday into Sunday. Some of the snowfall totals we're looking at, they're not huge, but it's just this mixed precipitation that is the problem and creating pretty treacherous road conditions. Do not be surprised if tomorrow we start seeing things like uh, freezing rain advisories and travel not advised. Fog is still absolutely a problem for us. Visibility will be up and down tonight, tomorrow morning, Saturday, and into Sunday again. It's all because it's so warm. Okay, we're looking for minus 11 and a chance of freezing drizzle tonight in the Red Lake region. We're going to be watching for fog through Winnipeg, a very slim chance of some flurries. This is also going to be extended into the Dauphin Swan River area. I'm going to talk about you more in a second because I'm worried about you. Really windy tonight in the Churchill region, north 40, gusting 60. As we look to tomorrow, sunshine and increasing cloud for Churchill, chance of flurries in towards Lynn Lake and Flin Flon. Swan River and Dauphin tomorrow afternoon. Ice pellets and freezing drizzle are your primary concern, and that is going to be a problem for us. We're going to be watching for fog in the morning, snow in the afternoon, and actually kind of an easier day in towards that Western Ontario area. Emily? Thank you, Fiona. You're welcome. A film with Manitoba connections is getting some Oscar and Golden Globe buzz. Women Talking is directed by Canadian Sarah Polly and based on a novel by Miriam Taves. Winnipeg-born costume designer Keita Alfred got some help and some inspiration from her Manitoba and Mennonite connections while designing the lead character's clothes. Here's Alfred's story in her own words. <laughs> We were given two days to forgive the attackers before they returned. We hardly knew how to read or to write, but that day, we learned how to vote. Do nothing. Stay and fight. Wait. Leave. If we do not forgive these men, we forfeit our place in heaven. Our choice will be your future. My name is Keita Alfred, and I'm the costume designer for Women Talking. My teachers, my colleagues, my teammates, my friends, schoolmates, are many of them are Mennonite, and I'm, and I know that the culture is has a lot of history here in Manitoba. So if if I were allowed to do some research here, I think we could get the most amazing information. Uh, and so the studio, Lynn Lutubello, allowed me to do that. Uh, people went out of their way to share their heritage with me, to share their knowledge, to share their uh, methods of their manufacturing methods, the reasons behind those manufacturing methods. So because of that graciousness, everywhere I went this happened in the community. Um, I wanted to make sure that the costumes were as accurate as possible. And because I had access to people who were familiar with plain dress 
and even some of whom even lived that way, I was able to get the details correct. Within those very narrow but accurate parameters for plain dress, I had to choose fabric and uh, textures and colors and scale of pattern to almost subliminally uh, represent character for each of the individual characters, the actors in our room. I said to them all, all the actors, it's like, this, here's, your, here's what your dress is going to look like. <laughs> and I, you know, I often make very narrow parameters like this, but within that, how are we going to pull out character? How am I going to be able to provide you with things that will help you develop your character? For the Friesens, I saw pure tones of purples and blue, bright blues, electric almost colors, um, repetitive forward-moving patterns on a smaller, regular scale. It's, um, I, I use the word electric a lot, I'm not quite sure why, um, implying motion and forward, mo forward motion. With the Loans, I was drawn to more natural colors like greens and browns and purples, more irregular patterns that involved swirling and florals to a certain extent, but um, looser patterns that to me spoke of murkiness and uh, perhaps deep troubled waters. Not only did we use the outside details, we also, um, and in discussion with each actor, we chose body augmentation um, that you don't see uh, on camera. It's, it was to, to help the actors perhaps change their physicality. I do this when I say it, but you know, not, none of those women had had 10 children and lived on a farm all their lives and done back-breaking hard farm work all their lives, so they wanted to experience living in bodies that weren't like their own. So we did a little bit of addition or subtraction or restriction. We, um, a couple of the actors wanted something that would remind them of maybe being in labor 10 times and maybe your pelvis was exhausted after that and maybe you needed some sort of support, li literally and figuratively, to keep your body together and to, and to allow you to keep going. There are elements under the costumes that were also, for us, part of the costume. They help the actors move in different ways. You know, we just wanted to make sure it was accurate and respectful. At every point we wanted to be respectful because we had been given, and I in particular, in my research and in my help, was given the best help possible. Still ahead, home renovations aren't just for your house. When we come back, Jim Agapito shows us how your home on wheels can have a whole new look. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
renovations don't have to be just for your house. Jim Agapito joins us now from the Winnipeg Renovation Show, and his next guests have put a bit of a twist on home renos. Jim, tell us where you are at the show right now. Emily, I'm here at the booth at Revolution Trailers. They're based here in Winnipeg. Now, I know when you're thinking about camping in an RV or fifth wheel, you might have memories of your parents' old camper. You know, the one with oral, orange floral curtains, vinyl seats, pretty old. But my next guest, well, they'll take your home on wheels and turn it into a stylish new home. Stu Pino and Megan Clary, you join me now. So Stu, tell me, what's Revolution Trailers all about? We're all about preserving trailers, making them modern, making them efficient, making them fun, and making them affordable for people. Yeah, I mean, I took a look inside, and it looks like quite the feat. So, Megan, I got to ask you, it's not just about making them look stylish and new. It's much more. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, our big one of our biggest goals is to keep them out of the landfills, and we will reuse, rehome, recycle anything that we possibly can out of them. And we're proud to say that to date, we've kept over almost 200,000 pounds out of the landfills. Wow, so I look at something like these two trailers here, I mean, it's a before and after, what went into that work? Well, with this one here in particular, we had some structural problems with it, so we had to fix a little bit of framework and a little bit of flooring, subflooring, and then we do our normal, which is put in vinyl flooring, uh, LED lighting, uh, painting, cabinetry, all that kind of stuff. So a lot, a lot of work goes into these trailers. Yeah, and what's the challenge of doing something like this compared to, say, renovating a home? <laughs> it's just like renovating a home, except it's not. Yeah. It's completely different, actually. Small spaces, small structures, different framing. It's, it's much, much different than renovating a house. So how do these trailer makeovers, you know, stack up in cost, you know? Is it more expensive to buy a new one, or what do you think? It's a lot more expensive to buy a new one. Um, with the supply and demand, supply chain issues that the, we've been seeing since the pandemic, the, the cost of new is a lot more. Like, we come in typically sort of half to two-thirds the cost of buying a new one, and you get a one-of-a-kind, brand-new-looking, brand and completely original design. Okay. What's the joy that both of you have in making something old, new? Well, I love that we get to do something different every single day. So we do, we do everything. So we do flooring, we do painting, we do design. We get to really go into the spaces and see how we can make them much more efficient and a better use of the space. So you're working with a small footprint, so every square inch counts. Seeing the reaction on people's faces. I can't say the words on TV that they use, but most people are super impressed and they can't believe it's an RV. Yeah, it, it's great. I mean, I can't imagine the joy. What are the stories you hear from people? Oh, I, our favorite thing is when somebody walks in and says, this is nicer than my house, or I can't believe this is an RV. That, to us, that's the biggest compliment we can get. Well, that's great. So come down and, you know, see Revolution Trailers. Stu Pito and Cl Megan Clarehue will show you what it's about and catch them here at the Winnipeg Home Renovation Show at the RBC Convention Centre. It runs till Sunday. Come down. You can find tickets online at their site at winnipegrenovationshow.com. Sad news in music. Winnipeg-born Robbie Bachman, drummer of the famed Canadian rock band Bachman Turner Overdrive, has died. You ain't seen nothing yet. Let it ride, taking care of business. They were among BTO's string of hits of the 1970s. The band formed after Robbie's brother, Randy, split from the Guess Who. Robbie was just 18. Discord eventually broke BTO apart, but its success ultimately led to the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Robbie created that success to leaving or credited that success to leaving the 1960s social upheavals behind. He said the songs never told people what to do, just to have a good time. Still ahead, Fiona Odlum is back with your seven day forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Welcome back. We're in for a very warm weekend. We're looking for minus three for tomorrow, minus one for Sunday, and even for the start of the work week, looking for minus five degrees. I want you to note, though, on Saturday, we're going to start and end our day with fog. There's going to be a little moment in the middle there where we might see a little bit of sunshine coming our way for our Saturday. No, oh, that's not so bad. That's not terrible. A little bit of sunshine. I'll take that. Yeah. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> a Toronto taxi driver had quite a memorable day at work. He got an extra unexpected passenger. A woman gave birth to her baby in the back of his cab. We caught up with the driver to hear how it all happened. And that is our daily lift. I received a call this morning at about 6 a.m. Uh, when I arrived to the destination, the person told me they wanted to go to the hospital to deliver their baby. En route, she realized that the journey, it wouldn't have made, we wouldn't be able to make it to the distance. So I pull off the highway then, in which time she was talking to somebody uh, from the health department. At that point, I was told to try and make it to one of the nearest hospital. And as I was going south in Markham Road, the baby started to appear. I pull over in the gas station, the Shell gas station at Markham and Ellesmere, and uh, I call 911. They tell me they would have emergency personnel there as quick as possible. And by the time they arrive, the baby was already born. I was on the line with the emergency uh, operator and they advised us to make sure the baby was warm and that the card wasn't around the child's neck. I was thinking that, you know, I hope that the baby and the mother would be safe. I just think it's the most amazing news. It's been quite a few years since we've had a baby born in a taxi and I just, you know, after speaking with Vernon, um, I just think that you know, he was in the right place. He, he was exactly where he should be today. To be honest, still a little bit uh, shaking from the experience, but I would do it again if I have to. I feel like I did what was best for me to do. I feel that I, I make a difference. Sounds like they got the right taxi driver. <laughs> he is so calm. I would do it again. Wow, no that's problem. the person you want while you're having a baby in a cab. Yeah, no kidding. Amazing. Not maybe the optimal place to have a kid, no. but I'm glad it all went well. <laughs> and that was the CBC Winnipeg News. We'll be back at 11. Have a good evening. Good night. Have a good weekend.